Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In Oklahoma County, in Oklahoma, on this occasion, there had been a big snowstorm and nothing was moving on the street. There weren't even any tire tracks. I was about 15 years old and worked at a fast food restaurant about a mile north of this location and was forced to walk home because my father had called and told me that conditions were so bad he couldn't get the car out of the driveway. The heavy blanket of snow made visibility good, reflecting light as it does. As I cleared some trees to the east, I observed movement to my left through peripheral vision and looked to my left into the ravine and saw a figure apparently playing in the snow. For an instant, I thought that it was a child wearing a dark colored snowsuit, but as the moment passed, I became very aware that this was no child. I had a very clear view of it and could see that it was black or very close to black and covered with long hair or fur from head to toe. It was probably around five feet tall and weighed about 160 pounds. The creature continued playing in the snow, bending over at the waist and throwing snow up into the air with both hands in a wide scooping motion, throwing it up so that it came back down on its head. It also began rolling in the snow. I felt stark terror at the sight of the thing. I was also very unnerved, knowing that I was very far from any residential area in the early morning and that there was absolutely no traffic on the road. The creature was only about 30 to 35 yards from me, and I had about an eighth of a mile to clear until I was out of sight of the creature. I thought about running, but I feared that my footfall and rapid motion would catch the thing's attention and that it would then begin chasing me, as is instinctive for a lot of animals. The point is, I had quite a bit of time to view this thing, and the longer I looked at it, the more I realized what I was looking at did not fit any rational explanation. Once I was out of sight, and I thought I was out of earshot, I ran as fast and as far as I could. This area is now a park, Hafer Park, but at the time nothing was there but a wooded area and the ravine, which is a drainage ditch. Even now with the park, there is still a good deal of wooded area there. Locals have dubbed this creature the skunk ape, reportedly because of its terrible odor. I did not smell anything in this incident, but I have a very poor sense of smell and serious sinus and allergy problems, which are routinely exasperated by the cold weather. The sighting was between 1.30 to 2.30 a.m. It was heavy, heavy snowfall, enough to stop any traffic on the roadway. The blanket of snow added visibility by reflection. It was very cold, of course, just off of a four-lane roadway, at the time, no residences or businesses were within about a mile except to the north. The area to the east of the roadway was a creek drainage ditch, becoming a wooded area a short distance from the roadway. To the west, a field and a wooded area beyond, a shopping center to the north, about half a mile. The area where the creature was actually standing was a creek bottom, rarely filled with much water. I've heard accounts of other smaller statured Bigfoot or skunk ape, but the closest sighting I know of were in El Reno. I remember seeing a story about these creatures on a local television nude broadcast a couple of years after this incident, but I can't remember many of the details. On to the next one.
What has reddish brown hair, stands a stocky four to five feet high, and smells like a sewer? That's what some folks around here would like to know. Bill Perry, a 15 year old high school freshman, says he saw such a creature while scouting for coyote tracks along Trail Creek near his home of South Beachy. His family says it prowled on their property and near their house for more than a month this winter. Hair samples were found by Perry's house, was sent to Sasquatch Investigations of Mid-America. Was it from a Bigfoot? The hair sample looked very interesting. At this point, we cannot confirm what kind of animal it came from. Adding a sample was being forwarded to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Forensic Lab in hopes of analysis. I feel it's just a matter of time before a Bigfoot is captured alive says Director of Sasquatch Investigations of Mid-America. Dewey County Sheriff Larry Pike, on the other hand, says he has heard only rumors about the strange animal, but nothing official. Sightings also have been reported in nearby Roger Mills County. Search parties were formed after similar sightings of an unidentified creature were reported in eastern Oklahoma, near Brislau and Stillwell. Nothing was found. Vichy is in Dewey County. On to the next one. In Cherokee County in Oklahoma, it was near the Illinois River southeast of Park Hill. I was out with my fraternity camping near the Illinois River. It was around early October. We were in a small clearing near the river under a small hill. There were several of us in the group. Me and two of my friends walked into the tree line under the hill to gather some firewood for the campfire. It was dark, and we had only one flashlight. As we gathered wood up on the side of the hill, something started rustling through the trees. The hill was thickly covered in sumac, which would be very difficult to navigate, especially in the dark. Whatever was on the hill started approaching us maybe about a hundred feet away. It was starting to break some of the branches in the sumac and sounded big. We couldn't see anything through the dense brush, but whatever it was, was coming towards us. One of my friends picked up a rock and threw it toward whatever was making the noise. It stopped just momentarily and then began running in our direction. At that, we all got scared and ran back to the campfire where the rest of the members were. None of the rest of our fraternity members heard anything. We thought they may have been trying to prank us, but all said they'd been right there waiting for us to bring back wood. We all decided to end our outing and got in the vehicles and headed back to the campus. This is about the best I can remember what happened. It's been many years now. The only other thing I can remember right now is that there was a musty smell about the time, whatever it was. Whatever it was started walking down the hill. It smelled like dead fish in stagnant water. I'm no expert in sounds, but whatever was rustling was making footfalls that sounded bipedal. We were looking for firewood. We stayed fairly close since we only had one flashlight. We'd walked away about 300 yards from our other fraternity members into the tree line and were out of sight of them. I don't think we could hear them because of the river running. It had just rained quite a bit and the river was full. It was around 10 p.m., clear night, no moon. Very dark, but stars were out. It was calm winds and cool, probably in the 50s. It was a flat area near the river. However, the hill was close by, within about 300 feet. It was probably within about a half to one mile of farms and houses nearby. One of my other fraternity members, he didn't gather wood with us, had told us that when he and his brother were younger, they lived further up the river, about seven miles in the woods. One night when his parents were gone, he and his brother were at home and something started banging on the side of the house. They were too afraid to go look. When their parents got back, they told them what happened, and their dad went outside and found some large, 
barefoot, human-looking prints around the house. They were going to take pictures the next morning, but it rained and washed the prints away. On to the next one. Neosho, Missouri. I used to live there in the early 2000s. I used to deliver pizzas and got off late in the evening. Same route home every night. A quarter of a mile before my driveway was a sharp left turn with a big evergreen tree on the outside of the corner. One night, I was coming to that corner and noticed forward-facing eyes shining from within the base of the big evergreen. As I approached, I was looking intently for what little critter it was as I am a nature lover. The closer I get, I'm having a very hard time seeing what it was, and in hindsight, it's because my brain wasn't processing what I was seeing very well initially. As I got right up to the turn, I saw it in full. My best description is a goat boy, a pan-like creature, human head, very small with reflective eyes, a small torso that was pale in complexion and brown hairy legs and little tiny hooves. I almost came to a complete stop looking at it. I didn't know what I was looking at until I took the turn. My headlights were now off it directly and it was looking at me with the ambient light in the car through the passenger window. At that point, we had made eye contact and I became terrified and floored it. I had a vision of my family and friends finding me in the woods dead. I ran into my house, freaking out and told my wife and two friends there at the time. Of course, it was laughed off and I'm just tripping. My neighbor and friend at the time then heard about my story and was like, man, you ever heard the screams that come from the woods behind the townhouses? I actually had not, but he was adamant that he had heard something back there multiple times that was not a North American animal. Then, about two months later, one of the friends that was at my house that night was at his dad's house telling the story about me and his dad over years and looks at him sharply and asks, how the heck did he know about that creature? He then tells him that when he was a kid, him and his friends used to party out there. There wasn't anything built out there back then, except a little dirt road, and this is in the 70s. One night, him and his buddies were sitting around the fire, and he had to take a whiz. One of his buddies did too. They got up, walked, 10 yards and let her rip. He said he'll never forget what he saw next or how it sounded. Midstream, the small three foot goat boy ran out of the woods, screamed this god awful scream at them, and then ran off into the woods. They all packed up and never came back. That place where they partied was less than a hundred yards from the tree I saw it in. To this day, I can vividly remember it standing there. I don't tell too many folks about that. On to the next one. My wife and I purchased three acres on a small lake near Rushville, Illinois. It was all just timber and adjoining a small hill range that followed the Illinois River about two miles away. That extended at least 100 miles long to around Alton, Illinois. We hired a friend of ours to bring his cat nine bulldozer in and build us a huge circle drive and a huge level pad down in the timber with a small pad for a yard. And I cut a path about 150 yards long through the timber down a huge hillside to the lake where I built a dock for fishing and to keep a small fishing boat. 
we had a small camper and a one-bedroom mobile home that we'd put on the pad for camping. We had no electricity or running water because at that time we couldn't afford to install them. So we used candles and carried in water when we camped there. We camped and fished there on the weekends for four or five years without incident, but it was always an eerie place at night. If we could not go up on a given weekend, I would loan it out to some of our friends to go camping. One weekend, we loaned it to a lady I worked with and her husband. They had used it several times before. When she came to work Monday morning, she gave me back the keys and told me that they would never be using it again, that they had left and left their stuff there and asked if I could bring it to them, that her husband had encountered something on his way to the dock at about midnight, and all he would tell her is that it stood upright, was tall and hairy, and had glowing yellow-green glowing eyes. They never went back. But I just blew it off because I didn't ever see anything myself, and I was not the least bit scared of a night in the woods. About two months later, we were there in August, and the night there was a full moon. It was a beautiful, warm night, and we had a nice campfire going. Around the mowed perimeter of the campsite, I had kerosene torches lit to give us some light. Past the torches, was just thick, old timber. I went behind the camper to relieve myself by the woods, and while I was doing so, I had an eerie feeling come over me that something was watching me. So, when I was done, I walked the tree line, looking into the woods to see if I could see anything. I couldn't see anything but the reflection of the torches in the thick trees, but I could hear heavy footsteps in the timber. When I stopped, they stopped. When I turned around and went back, they turned around and went back. It really freaked me out. Something was stalking me. I was sure of that. But I would never get to where I could see it in the torchlight. I went back to the campfire, which was between the camper and the one-bedroom mobile home. And I told my wife, that something was out there, and it sounded huge. I told her I was not staying the night. So we locked the door on the mobile home, got in the truck, and drove the 35 miles to the small town we lived in. We left the torches burning and the campfire surrounded by concrete blocks burning. We decided the next morning to go back up there to make sure everything was all right and retrieve our supplies, cooler, fishing equipment, and everything else. When we got there and pulled down the one-lane road through the woods, I could see stuff strewn around on the ground. The torches and campfire had all burned out. When we got down to where we parked, I could see the little camper was untouched, but the metal door on the mobile home was hanging almost torn off by one hinge, and the inside screen door was completely destroyed. I got my pistol from my truck and went inside. It was torn to pieces. Even the kitchen sink was torn out, lying on the floor. The couch was shredded. The little kitchen table was smashed. Even some of the paneling was broken and torn off the wall. Then I went into the little bathroom. The sink had been torn out and was gone. In the little bedroom past the bathroom, the bed was shredded and a mirror on the wall smashed. I was in shock. This had to have been something very strong to rip those sinks out. The press board wood that they were made of was just splintered. Like you hooked a chain to the sink and to your truck, and just drove off, ripping it apart. So he drove about five miles into town and went to the police station to report it. Two deputies followed us back out to the campsite and went through everything to investigate. They told me 
All they could think of was maybe it was done by teenagers high on meth. We even walked out in the timber to try to find track. It was very dry out and the clay ground was hard, so we found nothing. But we did find the little bathroom sink out there. We never stayed there again. I went up and tore apart the rest of the mobile home, all during the daytime hours and never alone, and gave the frame to a guy to make a trailer out of, and we lifted the property with a realtor and sold it. That was over 30 years ago. I drove past it recently, and whomever bought it did nothing with it. It is all grown up and unrecognizable now. The police never found anything, and I haven't spoken about it for years. I found that even though I had proof of the destruction, people I told the story to thought I was crazy. One guy told me he thought it was a werewolf. I never found out. I still don't fish at night and don't stay out much at night, especially during a full moon, which I used to love. On to the next one. On a night out at sea, the weary sailor longing for home has stood alone upon the decks of his ship, wishing to be with his loved one. Instead, strange fate and unexplainable love for the ocean pulls them away from a safe harbor and open hearts. Some unlucky enough to think to dark emotional depths have returned home to tell tales of demons, beasts, and things unknown to the average man. Of the ancient 17th century sailing vessel, in mint condition, searching forever, onward with no mind to stop or seek help, a feeling of dread fills the room at the mention of the name. It has been known to kill sailors, make entire crews disappear, and force a league of widows to join their husbands at the bottom of the sea. She is, the Flying Dutchman. One fact has escaped most of us who have heard the legend in all the horror, folktale, and ghost stories. The Flying Dutchman is not a ship, but refers to a stubborn ship's captain who dared to challenge the god. His name was Captain van der Decken, and in 1641 he was the most experienced navigator to plot his way around Africa's Cape of Good Hope. He sailed the waters of his time with skill and the admiration of all. Admiration has sometimes been known to breed the emotions of arrogance and want. Legend had this mad Dutch captain battling a horrific storm on one of his many trips around the Horn of Africa with a new and untested crew. These men knew nothing about his cruel nature or the fact that he was a prideful navigator. All the crew did know was that the ongoing storm was powerful enough to destroy their ship. There were also paying passengers on their way to India. These concerned few joined forces with the crew, begging the captain to turn around, to give up his traditional way past the horn. This is where there is confusion in the legend. Either the captain was heartbroken due to a new love turned sour, or he was just a plain old-fashioned drunk. In any case, the captain swore up at the storm, lit a pipe, and calmly retired to his cabin for the night. Orders were to stay the court, no matter the price. As the night moved on, the storm grew worse. Alarmed, the captain returned to the bridge. With tears in his eyes, the Dutchman shouted out curses and threats to God. Even sailors, known for their skill and profanity, knew that their master crossed the line of decency. Something had to be done. Mutiny. The uprising was not successful. So enraged was the captain that he killed the mutiny leader, throwing the dead man overboard. His drunken ravings called up the attention of the devil, so amused was the Prince of Darkness that when he heard the splash of the former mutineer's body hitting the ocean, he stopped time to visit the captain. 
the clouds parted and the storm ceased to be. Who is this mortal who panders death as if cheaply? The devil stated, disguised as a shadowy creature near the ship's main mast. The Dutchman replied with a line of curse words that made the devil proud. Before Satan knew it, a musket was pointing him in the face. A man was challenging the devil. I never asked for your advice, sir. Now, off my ship with the body, and let us continue onward. As you wish, sir, the devil started to leave. Satan turned, pointing a stern finger at the captain. For your actions and disrespect for my curiosity, you will be condemned to sail these waters. You will command a ghostly crew of corpses, bringing death to all who witness your sails. The devil was heard to laugh, for how long the legend does not say. You shall never make port, nor shall you ever find peace. The storm resumed where it left off, and the ship continued onward. The Dutchman saw the errors of his way, pleading to the devil for a rescue. Gall shall be your drink, and red-hot iron your meat, was the last of Satan's words. From that fatal moment on, the Flying Dutchman was doomed to pilot his ill-fated ship throughout the spectral waters, never resting and never finding a home or safe harbor. His crew so it is assumed, left with the passengers when they could. On no sighting of the vessel has there ever been crew members or captive who begged to disembark. Sailors have spotted half-dead creatures crewing the ship station, their skeletal faces grinning into the darkness. It is also claimed that sightings of the ship has caused other ship's food supplies to go bad, covering with mold and drying out almost instantly. Water supplies have either dried out, salted over, or turned sour. On some occasions, the Dutchman has come alongside other ships to perform a simple act, deliver mail. If an unlucky sailor or ship receives a delivery from the ghost ship, it brings disaster. If a sailor opens his letter, he dies or is found dead before dawn. If another captain refuses to dock with the Dutchman, that ship will flounder. Eyewitnesses claim to have spotted the Dutchman at the wheel of his vessel, crying up to the heavens. His bare head was covered with regret and the long labor of repentance. He was hoping and praying for someone of divinity, not only to take note, but to grant him peace. It seems that although God may forgive, the devil never forgets. This is the legend and fate of the Flying Dutchman. This story has been told and revamped throughout the centuries, written as a ghost story and sung as an opera. Many notable and believable sightings of the Phantom Ship have been recorded. Every time modern societies think they have advanced beyond the needs for ocean-based superstitions, the Dutchman makes his presence known. During the Second World War, a crew of German U-boat officers was captured in the mid-Atlantic by an American Liberty ship heading for Great Britain. The submarine inadvertently hit an Allied mine, and their ship perished. Only seven of the crew survived, finding their way into a small lifeboat. All claimed to have spent some time on board an old sailing ship. The captain of the U-boat was babbling, stating to his confused American rescuers, the dead live. The crew disappeared into the bureaucratic paperwork of a world war. Presumably, they were all taken to a local British mental ward and treated. In 1836, a British war vessel almost collided with the Dutchman, but the ship vanished into a fog at the last minute. After the encounter... The first officer of the ship committed suicide. There was left behind no letter of explanation or farewell to family. Officers on board were shocked because they all knew the religious belief of their fallen comrade and understood him to be the kind of man who would never commit God's one unforgivable sin. 
what could drive a person to take their life. On July 11, 1881, the HMS Bacanti was rounding the tip of Africa, and a midshipman on watch spotted the spectral vessel heading his way. The sailor signaled to the approaching ship, then, without warning, as if trying to avoid the bachinet, the ancient wreck vanished. The midshipman wrote these words in the log. I insist that this encounter is dutifully recorded in our records. State that we all saw her with her own eyes. The ghost ship is known as the Flying Dutchman. This midshipman was a man of good character and a royal prince who would later become King George V. Although no harm came to the future King of Britain, the lookout who informed the prince about the advancing ghost ship fell from his post and died. The last recorded sighting of the famous ghost ship took place in May of 1942 off the coast of Cape Town. Four witnesses, including a government-employed lawyer, saw the Dutchman sail into the middle of Table Bay, drop her anchor, and vanish. Most folklore scholars have stated that the tale of the Flying Dutchman was based on an actual event of a famous shipwreck, and that the reality of the legend should be taken with a huge grain of salt. They state that even the captain's name is wrong. Van der Decken, Van Damien, Van Stratton, or Van Summonsuch. There is even a story about a Dutch captain sailing around the Cape of Good Hope in 1641, working out a, a private business agreement with the East India Company. He planned to retire, take his family to India, and live a life of luxury. His retirement, of course, never happened. His wife left him for another man, and the captain was heartbroken. He failed to keep track of the ship's course, and ran into a dark storm in his misery. The ship sank with the commander still at the wheel. Those who survived were heard saying the captain was a brave soul he was. He stayed at his post as if defying the will of God. He said to the wind that he would make it around the horn and settle his life even if he had to sail his ship until doomsday. As the Dutchman finally found peace, since the sighting in 1942, there have been no other. In that episode, the only time the vessel was spotted near a harbor or to lower her anchor, could the unfortunate navigator have finally gained the forgiveness for which he searched. Legends and ghost stories serve a purpose. Some teach, some entertain. Others, like the Dutchman, warn, whatever you do in life, don't mock the devil. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!